Micah chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from a whole, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great, to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We chant responsibly Psalm 8.
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. <laughs> Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock, our redeemer, our Emmanuel. Amen. So we just sang a versification of the Magnificat, the Latin for, as Mary sang it, my soul now magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Here we are in the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, as we have remembered that Jesus is the one who brings uh, hope and peace and joy, who is himself love. We join with, as the church has done for nearly 2,000 years of singing with Mary, this song of love that God has placed into our hearts. Uh, Mary sings it because she, well, she's, it's not just that God is in the midst of her. God literally is in her. She is the Christ bearer. She is literally filled with Jesus, the one who is the Christ. 
So this season of Advent and Christmas, our theme has been Behold. It comes up uh, over a thousand times, translated into the English in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And as Mary sings or prays the Magnificat, she rejoices, she beholds what God has done for his people. The God who was there in the past, the God who is still there in the midst of his people, the God who promises to do great things. And for Mary, it's almost like the prophetic past tense. She says it as though it's happened, even though it hasn't happened yet, because that's how deep a trust that she has in the God who saves. But, but life for Mary, and I would guess for the one to whom she is betrothed, Joseph, was not just a, a life devoid of any disappointment. You know, disappointment, I mean, it's, it's when our expectations don't meet reality. I mean, that's the life of a Purdue fan, who's talking about it, just, I'm, I protect myself, like to be disappointed. But the disappointment I, I'm thinking about, I mean, it, it was probably shocking, but also disappointing for Mary when the angel Gabriel came to her, as recorded earlier in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel, da, 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 and he comes in and he says, Behold, Mary, you, are, <laughs> you, you, you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And behold, you're, you're already pregnant, and yet she's not, not, not formally married yet to Joseph. She's had no <laughs> relation with him in that way. Shocking, but maybe kind of disappointing. This wasn't how maybe she wrote the script if she was the author of her own life. And then what about Joseph? In a dream, maybe a nightmare to start, an angel comes. Joseph, behold, you, you, you are going to raise a young boy as your son, but, but you're not actually literally the father. And, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And, and Joseph wakes up from this dream, maybe a nightmare, and, and he had resolved in his heart to divorce Mary quietly because he was a man of honor and virtue, but he resolves now that he's going to stick it out. But I would guess there was some level of disappointment when your, your new wife is already pregnant with a son who is not yours. And yet, and yet Mary still sings or prays or voices the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, exalts in, extols the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For, for he has looked he has seen, he beholds the humble estate of his servant, and for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, saved. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And then the promise gets broader, and his mercy is for those who fear him, not just for one generation, but for generation to generation. He's shown the strength with his arm, the mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. There's this great reversal that's happening here. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. And it was on Tuesday as I was standing here preaching to the empty pews it's when it hit me. I had a vision of one of my favorite, most beloved Christmas characters. Not Mary, not Joseph, not the wise men, but my favorite. He's becoming one of my favorites. Ebenezer Scrooge. And you laugh, but he's, Ebenezer Scrooge is anything but a flat character. Ebenezer, whose first name is, it really has to do with stone, and his last name just Scrooge. I identify with Ebenezer Scrooge. One who I think, <laughs> behold, where was his focus? It would seem to be on anything and everything but the main thing. And as he strived for more and more gain, all he did was, was watch it all slip through his fingers. And he, oh, he seemed to be one who was, <sighs> was chronically 
disappointed. In fact, I think he would have been disappointed to not be disappointed. And I understand that. But, it, but he's anything but a flat character. So something changed in Ebenezer Scrooge. Something changed. But, but this character, and, and if you haven't read the novel, I would commend it to you. I learned that word at the seminary. You commend things to people. Recommend it to you. About 100 pages. Relatively short. So when we first meet Ebenezer Scrooge, and it is it's just a beautiful piece of literature, I'm learning to appreciate literature in my 44th year of life. Beautiful piece of literature, and, and Charles Dickens presents Scrooge in, in the introduction as this cold, empty, nearly dead, miserable man. I, I know why I identify with him, and even though Dr. Hartung, our mentor, he told me not to share this, but I'll tell you, I've said it before. I said it last night, Pam, you'll, you won't be surprised. I come from a long line of miserable people. And so, I get it. Scrooge is miserable. And then the more I thought about it, you know, by definition, Scrooge is an old miser. Miser, miserable, miser, is the Latin, wretched, pitiable. Oh, I get it. But, but Scrooge, something changed in him, but when we, when we meet him, he's described as cold and old. He's got this awful voice that didn't thaw, Dickens says, even one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had no influence on him. He was essentially just a dead stone, a husk of a man. It says of Ebenezer Scrooge that as he would go down the street, that nobody in the street would even stop to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow even a trifle. No children asked him, What was it, a clock? What time is it? No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. And then, and I love my dogs. I mean, sometimes my dogs are so annoyingly pleasant and, and want more and more of attention. But Ebenezer Scrooge, it says, even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming, they would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. And then they would wag their tails as though they said, no eye at all is better than an evil eye, Dark Master. They didn't even want Scrooge to look in their direction. But Scrooge seemed to almost delight in this. What does Scrooge care? Dickens says, it was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Yeah, I, I get this. Finally, the, the, the men come and they are seeking alms for the poor. And they're cheery as it's Christmas time. And they ask Scrooge, what would you like to give? What would you wish to do? And Scrooge says, I wish to be left alone. Well, since you asked me what I wish, gentlemen, that's my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas. And I can't afford to make idle people Mary. Oh, Scrooge. Scrooge's life is, is, is empty and dried up. No connections. Oh, it's very cold. There is, is, is almost a deafening silence, but he seems to both fear and love this silence. It says that, that there is a young boy, a street urchin, if you will, who goes and peers into the counting house, formerly of Scroo uh, Scrooge and Marley, although we did learn that Marley died seven years ago, dead as a doornail. No doubt Marley was dead. Seven years has passed, but no one can even distinguish between Scrooge and Marley, and Scrooge kind of likes it that way because he might as well be dead. But, but this young street urchin, this boy, he peers in through the keyhole of the counting house, the place where, place where Scrooge and Marley dwelt, and he, and he breaks the silence, and he sings to Scrooge. God bless ye, merry gentlemen, 
but nothing you dismay. And Scrooge quickly snaps up his ruler, and the boy sees it, and he runs away silent. Scrooge can't even stand the sound of a blessing from a stranger. There was no There was no song of love in Scrooge's heart. He didn't want to hear even the strains of a Christmas melody. Oh, Scrooge. See, Scrooge, and if if there's a title for this sermon, it's, it's waking up to disappointment. I think Scrooge woke up every day to disappointment, chronic disappointment. Thomas, you shared with me earlier this week, because I talk about my sermon with everybody, I'm still talking through it, working through it, this, this uh, quotation that the, the Christian life does not promise freedom from disappointment, but it gives eternal optimism in the face of it. See, this is what struck me and maybe what was on my heart and mind. See, I, I am easily disappointed. And I identify because I think Scrooge would wake up every day to disappointment and he was good and maybe even in some twisted way delighted in finding more things to be disappointed in. I've thought about it even more. See, I think disappointment is merely a subcategory of complaint. To complaint, maybe, complaint is something that, well, here's this problem, I complain about it, I'm angry about it, but maybe it's a problem to be solved. But, but disappointment, I think the nature of disappointment is a little bit different. It has to do with this feeling of melancholy. And during Advent and Christmas, as we remember Christmas's past, as we look at the Christmas that's happening right now and we maybe extrapolate emptiness into the future, there's a feeling of melancholy. It says that Scrooge himself, as he went into his, uh, about his evening, that he took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. Disappointment, the time when expectations don't match our reality or what we had hoped for. Scrooge, his, his life is empty and dark. It says as he goes into his home and he has this strange encounter with the face of Jacob Marley on the door knocker, this dead face of Jacob Marley. Scrooge thinks it's strange, but he goes into his house and he goes up his stairs. And then we even learn about him that, that darkness is cheap. And Scrooge liked it. The old miser, miserable, pitiable, wretched. And then it's this encounter. See, I don't think Scrooge would have changed. He's not a flat character. Something changed in Scrooge. Had it not been from some encounter from the outside, and he has this encounter with the ghost of Jacob Marley, and in some sense, maybe it's a reflection of Scrooge himself, Jacob Marley, who is is dead, dead as a doornail. And he says to Scrooge, Scrooge notices that Marley has this chain, and he says, I wear the chain, Scrooge, that I forged in life. And I made it link by link, and it's not a short chain, and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is is its pattern strange to you, Scrooge? The link that was made of lock boxes and ledgers And Marley says, my spirit never even walked beyond our counting house. It it never roamed beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And now weary journeys lie before me. Oh, it was miserable. And then Marley tells Scrooge, you will be visited by three spirits. The ghosts of, of Christmas past and present and future. And it's the ghost of Christmas past, the strange spirit that reveals to us that Ebenezer Scrooge, he wasn't always this husk of a man, empty and cold and disconnected. 
We see that as the Spirit takes Scrooge back to his childhood, that strangely, instead of avoiding everyone, when Scrooge would see the people, he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them. And, and why, he wonders, did his cold eye glisten? And his heart that he thought was otherwise dead would leap as they went past. Why, he wondered, was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other a Merry Christmas? Why? He, he wasn't always like this. And then he sees a little boy, it's himself, in this sorry lonely boarding house. A little boy who is all alone save his books where he finds some companionship. And then, and then there is this encounter where Scrooge uh, meets or, or is revisited by his young beloved sister Fanny. And Fanny comes to Scrooge and tells him, you can come home now. Dad has sent for you. And Scrooge, who was probably disappointed by an all but engaged or loving earthly father. That's what it sounds like. And then we learn that, that Scrooge, he wasn't always this way. That Scrooge had a love interest, fiance. Her, her name is was Belle. And he's there with Belle, and, and he's having this conversation. And, and we notice in, in, in the, the story, it's, it's important. It says that Belle is there in this conversation with Scrooge, and she is wearing a mourning dress, probably of black. And there are tears in her eyes, and it says that they sparkle with the light of the ghost of Christmas past. And she says, it, it doesn't matter, Scrooge. To you, very little. She says, Scrooge, another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer you and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, then I guess I don't have any reason to grieve. And, and he says, well, what idol has displaced you? And she says it. A golden one. And then he justifies it. If it's true, well, maybe it's not. But he says there's nothing so hard in the world as poverty and emptiness. And she says to him, but Scrooge, you fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. And then she says, I, I have seen this, this man that I loved just die slowly. And your nobler aspirations, your good qualities just fall off and die off one by one until the master possession gain engrosses you. He wasn't always this way, but now he, he realizes. Scrooge would then see Belle with her family and with her children and grandchildren and the joy that she would have, and he would yearn for that, but it wasn't to be for him. And finally, after seeing the, the Cratchit family and their joys at Christmas and, and, and in their meager existence that they had so much, and wishing that he could say something to Bob Cratchit, wishing that he could provide for Tiny Tim. And then Scrooge sees into the future, and he sees his own funeral, and no one was sad to see old miserable Scrooge die. And it is a horror to him. Maybe even more than a disappointment. But something, something changed in Scrooge. Scrooge, who realized that he was disappointed and waking up to disappointment, he wakes up even to his own disappointment that maybe this isn't the way to live as he's disappointed in triviality and meaninglessness and emptiness. But he couldn't have realized all this on his own because a dead thing, a stone-cold dead thing, couldn't give life to itself. And so he changes. He repents. And he wakes up from what would be a nightmare into a blessed existence of warmth 
and light and connection and joy. Dickens says at the end that Scrooge had resolved to to treasure up every word that he heard. It sounds similar to treasure up every word. Something changed in Scrooge. Advent is a season not only of preparation and getting ready for Christ's, well, remembering His first coming, but getting ready for His second coming. Advent is also a time for repentance. To rejoice that, and we as Lutheran Christians would say, we've been taken from death to life, that we have been changed, that for all those things that are dead and dark and cut off, that we repent, Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us, and we yearn to hear and hear yet again that he has come to us who sit not alone and in darkness, but on light us a glorious light has shone and does shine. But identify with Scrooge and his disappointment... You know, the thing is, disappointment, subcategory of complaint. You know what I can't stand? I can't, st- I complain about people who complain. <laughs> no, I do. I'm good at finding that kind of stuff. And, and the other thing is, you know what I'm also disappointed in? People who are disappointed. Because I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> Pastor Luke and I were talking the other day. You're not disappointing. I hope I don't disappoint you. We were talking the other day, and, and, and I realized, and, and see, uh, as you were talking, something that you shared with, with Les Meyer, I think. It's uh, one of the Psalms, Psalm 13, one of my favorite Psalms, very short, only six verses. In Psalm 13, it is broadly labeled a Psalm of complaint. I guess I'm in good company, because I do come from a long line of miserable, complaining, disappointed people. Someone who complains about complainers and is disappointed in disappointing people, disappointed people. It it is David who comes before God and he says, How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? See, see, in my disappointment, I, I, well, I'm disappointed in other people. Really, all quite disappointing, really. Let me down yet again. But I'd be disappointed if they didn't disappoint me. And and then the thing is, I realize, you know what? I'm kind of disappointed in myself for being that way. But if I'm truly honest, you know who I'm disappointed in? God. Because why would you put me in the midst of such a miserable group of complaining, disappointed people? And then I point the finger right back at myself. And I point the finger at God. And in that brokenness and emptiness and repentance, I realize and confess again that God only gives into empty hands. That he gives comfort in the midst of melancholy. See, in the end, As David says, how long, how long will you hide your face from me? Verses 5 and 6, there is a turn here. And he says, and maybe he sings, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And it sounds to me a lot like a Magnificat. I will sing. My soul rejoices. My spirit voices. Not alone, but together that that God provides life and light and fills up people who would otherwise be empty. And Scrooge wakes up to his disappointment and is disappointed in his disappointment only to realize that, that, that God fills up the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty and those who despair of their emptiness then are filled up with the one thing needful. And God puts people in Scrooge's life who continue to, to come to him despite who he is. A sister, a nephew, a nephew named Fred, uh, 
a master of the counting house named Fezziwig who throws a great party. The Scrooge is connected to people. And so Scrooge wakes up from his nightmare into life itself, and then suddenly everything is changed, and there is light, and there is fullness, and there is joy, and there is singing. And the first thing Scrooge does on Christmas morning is what you're doing right now, is goes to church. And he blends his voice with the rest of those people who would have otherwise been disappointed. He rejoices in this great reversal that God did for him. And then he goes to his nephew Fred's house. Fred, who to Scrooge initially is so annoyingly optimistic. And every year Scrooge continues to invite old miserable Uncle Scrooge to dinner despite Fred's wife's, misgiving, wife's, wife's misgivings about it. But he has mercy. He feels sorry for Scrooge. And then so Scrooge, after he goes to church, he goes to Fred's house not to say, well, I'll finally show up this year. No, he comes a changed man, hat in hand. Fred, I'd love to come to dinner if you'll have me. And Fred and family bring him in. And then it's the next day that, well, Scrooge goes to the Cratchit house and he, he brings a turkey that's bigger than Tiny Tim himself. And Scrooge, who is born again to this new life. He rejoices, it says, he becomes as a second father to Tiny Tim. And he lives out the rest of his life as one who has been saved, who's been brought out of darkness into the marvelous light of following Jesus, the one in whom not only well, I do identify with him. Troy, Allen, Ebenezer, Scrooge, countrymen. Rejoices. That's the beauty of the one who comes and is our hope. The Christian life doesn't promise freedom from disappointment, but it does promise eternal optimism in the face of it. And so we have hope and peace and love and joy and love in Jesus. To him be the glory. Amen. And now may the peace that passes understanding guard our hearts and minds in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in whom we rejoice. Amen. We now stand and confess together the Apostles' Creed.